Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. How are you managing volatile cattle markets and the risks they pose to your business? We'll talk with a group of experts who will offer their practical advice on building your own risk management plan or refining your current cattle marketing strategy. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxter, coming to you today from NCBA's office here in Washington, D.C. All business owners are experiencing unprecedented risk these days, including those who raise cattle for a living. But some of the recent challenges we've been faced with in the beef industry are testing even the most skilled and prepared producers. So what are the tools, resources, and strategies you can apply in your own operation to help manage risk and set yourself up for success in this challenging and volatile climate? We're joined today by a knowledgeable panel of experts who will share their insights and help answer some common questions. First, we're pleased to have with us the Honorable Greg Ibaugh. He serves as USDA's Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs. Alongside Undersecretary Ibaugh is Don Close, Senior Vice President of Food and Agribusiness Research for Robo AgriFinance. Next is Jim Fryer of Montana. He's the incoming chair of NCBA's Live Cattle Marketing Committee and manages risk for a large Rocky Mountain cattle operation. And our final panelist is Tanner Beamer, NCBA's Director of Government Affairs and Market Regulatory Policy. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. You know, we obviously saw a couple black swan events. First, the Holcomb fire and obviously COVID-19 pandemic, and both had some significant impact on uh, the, the cattle markets. I'm curious, that led NCBA and others in the cattle industry to call for, for an investigation by USDA. Greg, can you tell us a little bit about what your key findings and the recommendations that came out of that recommendation or that uh, research? Sure, Kevin. Uh, you know, USDA's Packers and Stockyards Division is in charge of watching the markets and the uh, activities and movements in the market all the time. And so we're collecting data all through uh, the year. And so when the pandemic hit and also when the Holcomb fire hit, we had all that data available. So as the calls for an investigation came out, we were able to analyze that data. We put together a report that we released in July that talked about both different uh, scenarios. And that report had some recommendations that Congress is looking at right now that uh, changed some uh, authorities within USDA. We also changed some of the reports that we've already announced that we've changed the names of some reports to try to make them more responsive to the market. And then we also have a series of recommendations, but one of the recommendations that stood out the most was the recommendation that uh, we needed to work with the industry to help producers understand risk management tools that are available and maybe even work to develop new risk management tools. I'm anxious to talk more about those throughout the show. So, so obviously uh, we've experienced some challenging times in the cattle market before. Is volatility just the new norm for the market? The biggest changes we've had in the market are the past two years. That's the most recent on our mind. You know, we've had massive changes in slaughter capacity. Um, but at the same time, we also had the Lehman financial crisis, 2008. We had BSC, uh, 2002, 2003. So we've gone through volatility before. It's not necessarily new, but we've had these most recent events freshest on our mind and did make a, a huge market impact as well. Yeah, I think certainly the if 2020 and, and maybe parts of 2019 taught us anything, it should be that the only thing for certain is uncertainty. So how do you mitigate the effects of that? And I think right now in the current environment that we have with high beef cattle inventories and a pinch point at the packing sector with processing capacity, you know, that, that we, we've learned that when, when black swans hit, they hit hard. And I think that in the foreseeable future, as we start to work to normalize some of those levels, you know, there you're going to see some of those market effects that are uh, hitting pretty hard for cattle producers. You know, the one, the one thing I would add is as 
exports become an increasingly important part of our to against our total production, it's just that addition of international issues and international trade is adding to that volatility that will be common occurrence in the future. That's a great point. And how have these circumstances that both of you have just mentioned heightened the need for everybody up and down the beef value chain to, to take a more aggressive posture towards risk management, Don? I, I think it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's inevitable. It's just part of our business environment today, uh, not only for the survivability of an individual business, but also with the relationship with the lender, with the relationship with, with end users, that uh, all of these all these relationships are inter interrelated. Jim, you spend all day every day focusing on risk management of a large cattle operation. I'm curious, what are the benefits to producers who get serious about developing a comprehensive risk management plan? Yeah, so I mean, number one, you're going to have a better relationship with lenders. You're going to have uh, a marketing plan you can follow. You can manage your leverage and equity better, but at the same time, you can take a proactive approach, you know, in marketing your cattle. You're going to start to spread that marketing decision over time, and with volatility, there's going to come some, some opportunities as well. So, I mean, diversifying your marketing window is going to be a major thing, along with, with lending and financing. I no? think that okay, as uh, you know, cattlemen in general are are pretty independent. You bet. And we really haven't been the kind of people that thought about risk management, especially cow calf producers like myself. Right. And as a crop producer, you think about risk management tools all the way through. You use federal crop insurance. You uh, naturally uh, go to the board of trade and maybe hedge or take a sure. position. But that's not something that I think in some segments of our cattle industry are very common. And I think it's uh, that's why I think it's a a great opportunity, a great time to use the lessons learned to look and see can we change the way we do business to take some of that volatility out for our operation. Yeah, and I think just building off of that, I think that it, when we talk about risk management, oftentimes I think the image that pops into a producer's head are spreadsheet upon spreadsheet of break-evens and a comprehensive suite of you know futures and options contract to mitigate risk there, and that certainly is a part of it. But risk management can be significantly more simple than that. You know, tweaking when you do uh, when you schedule calving season, uh, making some adjustments to your grazing rotations. Those are also tools that fall into the risk management bucket that are much easier. Uh, and probably more intuitive to the cattle producer. It's a great point. I mean, risk really is thinking about, number one, all the risks associated with your business and then figuring out how you can mitigate and manage those risks. Great conversation. Still ahead, we'll talk about more benefits of implementing a risk management plan and highlight some of the tools and resources available for creating a plan for your operation. Stressors that trigger bovine respiratory disease are all around. So when you spot BRD in your herd, turn to Suprevo, the fast that lasts. Suprevo is rapidly absorbed in as little as 45 minutes and lasts up to 28 days. Because in the race against BRD, you need to win. Ready, set, Suprevo. In case of human injection, seek immediate medical advice for use in beef and non-lactating dairy cattle only. For prescribing information, talk to your veterinarian or visit Suprevo.com. At Case IH, we believe it's our job to provide you with solutions. That's why our Farmall and Maxim tractors, as well as our tools and attachments, are designed with you in mind. From mowing to baling to loading and more, we're here to help turn your to-dos into to-dones. At Case IH, we'll keep your days running smoothly with equipment that's durable, versatile, and highly efficient. No wonder farmers are more loyal to Case IH than any other brand. Visit your local dealer or go to caseih.com forward slash livestock for more. Welcome back. We're coming to you today from NCBA's office here in Washington, D.C. to talk about risk management and some of the steps you can take to protect yourself and your cattle business. So I'm curious, Greg, what are some of the tools and resources USDA has available to help producers manage risk? I think one of the most important tools that a producer can have available to him as he works to manage risk is knowledge. 
and you need to know what the prices are, you need to be understanding what uh, is going on in the current marketplace. And USDA has a lot of different tools where we collect prices on a voluntary basis at local sale barns as well as through interviews with people conducting transactions within the marketplace and on the mandatory basis where packers are required to report what they buy and how much they pay for that. And so that's, uh, that gives producers access to reports that they can tell what prices are and maybe what they could expect to get for their cattle. We also then have other tools that are within the risk management agencies that work with private insurers to be able to subsidize products that producers can look at. And we recently just uh, within RMA updated some of those products to try to make them more user friendly for cattlemen. That's great news. Don from the private sector, I mean, he mentions insurance, what kind of insurance products and other risk management tools should producers be looking at? I I think the first thing that, that we provide to clients is the extensive amount of research that Robbo does providing clients information. But we're also uh, agents for a lot of the loan programs or insurance programs that the, the government offers. Uh, the other thing, the bank offers a full lineup of over-the-counter products that are very similar to conventional futures contracts, but have some versatility with the uh, the margin flow both in and out and enable that producer to structure that loan so it's all settled at the when the livestock are sold. Let's talk about CFTC, uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and what they've done specifically to increase oversight and also engage producers. Tanner? Yeah, so the CFTC is, of course, the regulating agency overseeing the commodities and derivatives markets uh, here in Washington, D.C. And Chairman Tarbert, uh, who leads the commission, actually deserves a lot of credit. He and his team have done a tremendous job uh, since the beginning of the Trump administration to reach out to NCBA to engage with cattle producers. Um, he actually visited our convention in San Antonio. We were able to get him out on a feedlot to see what that operation looked like and what they do in that business. Um, and so they've done a fantastic job of reaching out, but they've also been really busy in their enforcement division. Uh, there was a press release that came out very recently that said that they actually shattered the record for enforcement actions being brought in a single year. So they're really monitoring the markets to make sure that everybody's playing by the rules, make sure that those markets are functioning properly. Um, and then they're also uh, trying to ramp up their uh, own external face uh, education components, trying to make sure that producers uh, and uh, traders alike know what tools are available to them. Uh, Jim actually sits on the Ag Agricultural Advisory Committee over there at CFTC. Yeah, so I just joined that recently and we had our first annual meeting. And one of the things that we brought up in 2015 are uh, one of the most recent uh, previously recent volatile price periods was the fact that the CFTC and the CME both need to really expand their oversight and the function of the market. Um, there are many rules on the book that involve having a, a sound market. You know, market integrity is really what we're after. And the CFTC has done a good job recently about ramping up their oversight, um, adding technology to do that. And yes, this, this past year, their financial year, they had a, a very strong record on enforcement. So that's been a positive for our industry. Encouraging news. Now, Jim, you talk, oh, go ahead. I might uh, also yeah. just add that USDA plays a very close role with CFTC. Okay. During the initial days of the pandemic in March and April, uh, the secretary and I were on the phone with them, you know, monitoring how they were watching what was going on. Uh, we also have a liaison from the chief economist office at USDA, as well as AMS that works with CFTC. To, uh, and then we, of course, provide lots of market information to both CFTC and CME. Really is a cooperative effort. Jim, you talked to a lot of producers and certainly have been very engaged over the last several months with this live capital marketing uh, situation. I'm curious, do you see more producers utilizing hedging strategies in their overall risk management plan? And from your seat in the bleachers, what are some of the keys to success if we want to start incorporating some hedging uh, strategies? Yeah, so I have seen more people want to be involved. You know, there's definitely an increase in involvement, but then the big thing is, you know, trying a new, uh, new strategy, you know, getting 
familiar with the futures. And one of the struggles I've noticed is, you know, this is a, a pretty in-depth topic and it's, it's a little daunting for a lot of people. So coming in in March and April was really a tough time period to digest everything. So oftentimes the struggle is managing through the noise. Um, there's a lot more interest and I think that's a good thing. It's just a matter of, of doing the homework and making sound decisions really should be the focus. Tanner, what about NCBA? Does the NCBA have services and resources that can help producers as they try to ramp up on their risk management uh, knowledge and expertise? Certainly. I mean, there are there are several programs that USDA administers. Um, our producer education team in our Denver office does a really good job of putting out content. Uh, I think the Undersecretary and Don have both been featured on their webinar series in recent months uh, as we start to unpack the pandemic and the effects it had on the marketplace. But one of the other things that I think that NCBA provides particularly is a full-time staff here in Washington, D.C. that um, can, can take your concerns over to USDA, can have those conversations. If there's a product that doesn't work the way that it should, we can take that over to them. And as a matter of fact, the, a very recent change to the Livestock Risk Protection Program is a great example of that. You know, that, that program didn't really meet the needs of producers by and large, particularly on the cow-calf side of the equation. And so we, we took that feedback to USDA. They made some tweaks to the program to expand its use and access to uh, uh, all 48 states, and so that is, uh, that's, that's a program and a great example of how uh, NCBA partners with uh, our federal partners and, and puts win, wins on the board for the cattle industry. Excellent. And Mr. Undersecretary, I want to say thank you on behalf of all cattle producers for having such an open door policy uh, for the Department of Agriculture. You and the Secretary have been so good to work with. We appreciate that. Well, you know, uh, coming from production agriculture myself, uh, the rest of the team that the Secretary has assembled uh, comes from State Departments of Ag, Bill Northey, Ted McKinney, Richard Fordyce, and so it's, uh, it's pretty natural for us to uh, want to engage and be part of uh, embracing the problems and looking for solutions. We appreciate that. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the resources that USDA offers to farmers and ranchers to help manage risk, visit the website rma.usda.gov. And Rabobank, the world's leading financial services provider for the food and agribusiness sector, if you're looking for good sound tools and information, check out their website at rabobank.com. Also, NCBA prides itself on being the leading source of producer education. To find out more about all the educational opportunities and information available to beef producers, visit ncba.org. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll talk with a member of Congress about possible legislation that could help producers manage risk on their operations. Don't go away, we'll have more right after this. This is Hard Brand Cattle, family-owned, family-run, prime-focused, and home to the largest and best source for Akushi genetics in the world. U.S. commercial cattlemen are buying our bulls because they work. If you raise Akushi cattle, we have a buyback program. Our cattle grade 45% USDA prime, less than 2% select, averaging a 2.8 yield grade. It's time you earn premiums over commodity prices. Akushi provides beef customers with the best beef eating experience. Visit us at hardbrandcattle.com. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the oldest cattle industry organization, working every day to defend your interests in Washington, D.C. And there are big benefits to being a member. You'll get news you can use in the National Cattlemen and policy updates from Beltway Beef, plus big discounts from John Deere, Cabela's, and more great partners. Join now. Call 866-233-3872 or sign up online at ncba.org. Welcome back to Cattlemen and Cattlemen. We're exploring the topic of risk management and specific steps you can take to help set your operation up for success. And we're joined now by Representative Dusty Johnson of South Dakota, who has introduced legislation aimed at helping farmers and ranchers. Representative Johnson, thanks so much for joining us. And 
Can you begin by just explaining the Price Act and specifically how it will impact cattle producers? Absolutely. I'll back up half a, spe half a step, Kevin. I mean, I think we saw with the Holcomb fire and with COVID-19, really unprecedented volatility, uh, price swings, frankly, downward pressure on prices. There was a, a broad understanding, even among my urban colleagues, that we needed to provide some additional tools, some extra flexibilities for our producers. And so that's really uh, what the Price Act is. We've grabbed 12 different legislative ideas, a number of them from me, for, uh, some from Congressman Hagedorn and Lucas. Uh, Marshall, and this is our opportunity, I think, in areas of transparency, making better use of cover crop and CRP, uh, giving small processors more of an opportunity to grow in the market. Uh, those are our opportunities uh, to try to make sure that producers have more of an opportunity to earn a fair, decent living. So how important is risk management to farmers and ranchers, and how will your bill help producers manage risk in their operations? Yeah, so the Price Act uh, does call for additional transparency. For instance, I mean, I love making sure that the beef contract library uh, is put together and available, but those additional data points uh, aren't as helpful if producers don't have the opportunity to take that data and use it uh, by accessing some new risk management tools. Now, I think we all understand there been, uh, there's been good evolution in this space. So many players from land-grant universities, the CFTC, uh, they, they've tried to work with producers to develop better tools. Uh, so what we want to do in the Price Act is we want to charge land-grant universities with stepping up that game a little bit more and making sure that they're educating producers with what these tools are like, the changes that are being made to these tools. Uh, to the extent that livestock producers choose to use those tools, they are going to be better positioned to buy down their risk and make it through the, the darkest valleys. We all know there will be some good days, but also some bad days ahead. Representative Johnson, thanks again for joining us. We look forward to hearing more about the Price Act in the near future. And we're back now with our panel of experts as we talk more about managing risk in the beef industry. Tanner, what policy proposals has NCBA developed to address this issue of risk management in the beef industry? So Congressman Johnson's legislation, the Price Act, is actually probably the most recent and best example of that. Uh, it's called the Price Reform and Cattle Economics Act, and it incorporates a bunch of different pieces of legislation that NCBA has been working on over the summer, both before COVID hit and then afterwards as we were trying to deal with some issues. So uh, it incorporates the Direct Act, which allows for um, interstate shipment of uh retail qualities of beef so long as it's sold in, in uh, over the internet, incorporates the uh, BASIC Act, which is a piece of legislation that provides some federal assistance through either guaranteed loans or grants to those business entities that want to either construct new or expand existing processing capacity. Um, and then it also incorporates a bunch of different other pieces of legislation from the Senate side, um, all aimed at improving the overall marketing environment for cattle producers. We've heard a lot talking to producers about price transparency, and I'm curious, Mr. Undersecretary, what is USDA doing to improve and increase price transparency in the cattle markets? Well, of course, we always are looking at the reports that we put together, the information we gather, and how we can make that more useful to producers. AMS uh, launched My Market News, which actually uh, allows producers to customize a report. And in the next few weeks, we're going to be rolling out a kind of a self-help video that will let them walk through that to help them uh, do just that, customize it. We also work with Congress and groups like NCBA as they're working on legislation to understand, you know, most of the legislation the USDA has a role in. So how would we interpret that legislation? How would we Im implement that, which helps them determine on whether or not their idea is uh, uh, something that they want to see USDA implement? Interesting. And Jim, from NCBA's perspective and Live Cattle Marketing Group, what is NCBA doing to encourage and increase price transparency? Yeah, so I'll just roll back to our summer mid-year meeting and we went through a historic event having over a six hour committee meeting. And that just underscores everyone's commitment to come to the table and voice ideas and opinions on how to address price discovery within our, our industry. And one of the things that, that we settled on was 
was really trying to focus on robust price discovery. You know, and that's one of the things our committee is working on. A subgroup is on track to deliver a, a way to address that and to encourage robust price discovery. So in the next few months, we should see the fruits of that. Stay tuned, right? Yes, that is correct. Greg, uh, let's talk about price reporting. You referenced it a minute ago, but, but how do you anticipate or how would you recommend producers should use USDA's price reporting in their own decision-making process? So uh, going back to the information we gather, you know, we have uh, within 12 states in the central part of the United States, we're working in livestock auction markets, monitoring those uh, sales transactions that are happening on all different classes of cattle. And that is daily updated on our website. We have a weekly summary of that. We also are uh, uh, looking at uh, the video markets and recording those transactions as well. And so what it ends up is uh, have, we have this mass of data out there that's available to producers to be able to understand the market, be able to look at uh, classes of cattle, uh, compare them to what they have for sale, and help them know what to expect if they're going to the auction barn or if they're negotiating directly with a uh, feedlot it would help a cow-calf producer understand that as well. And of course, on the feedlot side, that's where the mandatory information sure. definitely comes into play, where we gather that from the packers and then make that widely available on a regional basis as well as uh, individual state basis. Don, what would you add? You know, the been working with a host of other countries and with the bank, and we absolutely take for granted just how much information we have through USDA compared to all of our other competitive countries in the world, uh, we're very well blessed. Yeah, very fortunate in that regard. You know, we talked a lot, go ahead, Tanner. Yeah, all four of us, I was just gonna say, use uh, AMS data on a daily basis, and that is made possible by the livestock mandatory reporting legislation that has to get reauthorized every five years. Uh, it was temporarily extended. It was supposed to expire on September 30th this year. Uh, Congress, in a continuing resolution, extended that deadline through to December 11th, but we do still need to get a full five-year reauthorization because that information is critical for producers as we've had conversations in the Live Cattle Marketing Committee about uh, transparency in formula transactions and uh, clarifying existing rules of confidentiality to uh, avoid instances of non-reporting, uh, we really need to have those LMR statutes in place in order to continue to receive that really critical data. Now, those are helpful nuances that a lot of us don't really know uh, are so critical to, to uh, this, this transparency in the marketplace. You know, we talked a lot about commodity-based pricing, and Jim, I'm curious, I've had a lot of producers that I've visited with uh, express even more interest in PVP programs and other programs that they can use to really add value to, to their uh, cattle operations as a way to manage risk and, and improve profitability. Tell us what you're hearing in that regard. Yeah, so that's a real great point. I mean, if you go to the USDA website, there's there's a very long list of different programs producers can participate in. You know, if it's a grass-fed program, there's different kinds of choice uh, benchmarks to reach for other programs. And this day and age, when we're talking about value added and a consumer, uh, it's pretty impressive. I mean, just think of the gourmet burger phase, right? And this, this continues to this day, and it's been going on many years, but there are ways we can participate in that. And it's not only choice select, you know, those quality grades, but we also have to be cognizant of yield too. So Packer will pay for, for yield as well. That's really helpful. The yeah. AMS programs are really those uh, uh, PVP programs yeah. allow a producer to work together with a group of producers or even individually. If consumers want to know where their food sure. comes from, they want to know the story of their food, sure. and PVP allows uh, USDA, an independent third party, to verify the claims they make so that consumers can actually trust what they uh, see at the marketplace, at the grocery counter. And I've seen, and when I was director of ag, we used in Nebraska those PVP programs to be able to make claims and be able to drive value uh, and you know, position our Nebraska beef uh, in the marketplace. All great tools in the toolbox. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll dive into a discussion on the cash and futures market and how they've been operating lately. Stay with us, we'll be right back. 
If you'd like to know more about NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen and have an opportunity to support our effort to create valuable news, information, and education just for cattle producers, then check out our website, cattlemen to cattlemen.org. Grass is the center of our universe. We've got to have a grass program that we can count on and plan on. That's what we need to sustain us, to keep us growing, to keep us prospering. Welcome back as we continue our discussion about tools and strategies you can use on your own operation to help manage and mitigate risk. Jim, as we look ahead, are there some changes that could impact cattle producers in terms of the cattle futures contract? So in early October, the CME expanded their price, daily price limits on both live cattle and feeder cattle futures. And so our goal looking ahead is to make sure that those don't create any kind of unnecessary risk or volatility. And one thing when the CME comes to us often in these requests and proposals, um, which they could do at any time on their own, is we want a, a strong market. We want market integrity that the futures is, is behaving properly because that is also sending signals out into the country. So we, we push back. That'll be one thing that we follow over the next several months is that that change is occurring responsibly. So Don, we hear a lot about basis volatility and the risk that comes along with that. Can you explain what basis risk really is? And more importantly, what can producers do to manage that? Sure, I'd be happy to. So basis is the cash price minus the futures price and that difference in, in between. So it's the exposure of matching up the futures price to the cash price on that exposure. And when we get into situations like the Holcomb fire or most certainly the disruption, the COVID disruption this spring, the market goes absolutely on tilt. And, and you've got situations where a producer's basis exposure is actually greater than his price exposure. And that becomes more challenging. You know, earlier Jim mentioned a, a lot of people that haven't been involved in the markets looking for these, these volatile times to get involved. So to bring a new participant into the market and explain to them the day-to-day -day procedures under a normal market, but then you have the added pressure of we're working with abnormal basis levels, it becomes critically important. Yeah, great point. You know, we've also heard a lot from producers about these thin cash markets and price discovery. And so I'm curious, Mr. Undersecretary, what does USDA have in terms of recommendations or policy recommendations relative to how we can improve price discovery? Well, obviously we uh, are identified that in our Packers and Stockyards report as something that producers needed more information to be able to understand. You know, as a cow-calf producer standing here listening to them talk about basis and CME and CFTC, you know, some of this is even complicated uh, for me to understand. And so USDA has uh, a grant program that's available right now that uh, will is open until the 17th of November to be able to have organizations like NCBA uh, work with uh, their local uh, land grant university to be able to put together a educational seminar or webinar for producers to understand this more. And so we think this is a great opportunity to tailor it to the state. You know, some states are more cow-calf heavy, some are have more feedlot influence. And so we're hoping that uh, organizations take advantage of that opportunity and use money from USDA to help producers understand, you know, some of this risk management strategy that we've been talking about today. And Tanner, in your position, you've been right in the middle of this price discovery conversation. From NCBA's perspective, what policy might we anticipate? 
Sure, so the, the live cattle marketing meeting that we talked about earlier that occurred in Denver a couple months ago, you know, that six hour meeting was largely focused on the issue of price discovery in the fed cattle markets. And there were a lot of different opinions on a lot of different ways about how we can go about increasing price discovery across all the cattle feeding regions. But despite the, the differences of opinion that, that definitely were, were raised, as is the, the, the way that that should happen in that type of a forum, there are two things that everybody in that room could agree on. One is that there's not enough negotiated trade in the fed cattle markets. And two, blanket government mandates that don't take into account the regional uniqueness of each of the five area is, is also not the solution. So to that end, they tasked a subcommittee with coming up with a voluntary approach to achieving price discovery. That working group was made up of six members of the live cattle marketing working group. They worked uh, pretty diligently for uh, twice a week over the course of two months to develop a framework that we put out just a couple weeks ago uh, that outlines how we think we can measure the progress that we're making in the negotiated market to get to that robust price discovery level that is necessary to make sure that we have a, a transparent marketing environment for all cattle market participants. Now, I've heard it said before that arguments are trying to decide who's right and discussions are about identifying what's right. And I'm encouraged uh, about all the diverse set of opinions you've had around that table uh, walking through this issue and discussing what's right for the industry. You bet, and I think NCBA is really one of the only places where that conversation can happen at the industry because we have such a diverse set of opinions. You had people in that room that um, are very strong proponents of AMAs, as, and rightly so. They, they play a really significant role in the marketplace. You had some in that room that were in favor of mandates. The cow-calf sector was very well represented, as was the cattle feeding sector. And still, NCBA found a way to bring everybody together in the same room and then all get on the same page. Ultimately, that price discovery policy that got passed was, was passed on a unanimous basis. And that really speaks to the, the role that NCBA plays in fostering those discussions. So Jim, as vice chair of that committee, uh, you helped facilitate that vibrant discussion. What would you add? Yeah, so two things I'd add to that is, number one, Tanner mentioned AMAs, and that is an alternative marketing agreement. Alternative marketing agreement. And that is where the live cattle price is predetermined some other way um, and that takes it out of a negotiated price bucket so that's one of the things we're trying to solve for those AMAs also mirror a little bit what's going on at the consumer level so you can imagine the Safeways, Albertsons, HEBs of the world they're they're also looking for um, ways to pass on known quality and quantity to the consumer and that's one method they do it and then that trickles down a bit to the live cattle side as well. The other thing I would add on this uh, bit of clarification too is that we came together, much of the industry came together and debated, you know, six plus hours, but one of those things that we settled on was voluntary to begin with, but we also need to acknowledge that, you know, we need to have some teeth to make sure the buyers are engaged as well. So if certain triggers are not met, we will fall back on having teeth and maybe approaching regulation as well. Very good, very insightful. Now, for more information on the Working Group's report or NCBA's producer-driven efforts on price discovery, you can visit the website policy.ncba.org. There's a lot more to discuss about risk management, and we'll have more from our panel right after this. If you're looking for outstanding forage developed Angus cattle, look no further than Yon Family Farms in Ridge Springs, South Carolina. The Yon Family is hosting their 17th annual fall sale on October 31st at 11 a.m., offering 100 females, 100 yearling bulls, and 200 two year old bulls. Proven genetics from a family committed to their customers. Find out more about the sale at yonfamilyfarms.com. We didn't just design the 6M tractors with you in mind. We designed them with you by our side. The new 6M tractors from John Deere. Reimagined by you, for you. With improved visibility, better maneuverability, and more ways to customize. So you get everything you need and nothing you don't. Experience the new 6M at your local John Deere dealer.
Welcome back as we continue our discussion about risk management in the beef industry. Don, you work all around the world and with all protein segments. I'm curious, what do you see in the future in terms of tools and technologies that could help us manage risk in the beef industry? You know, recently, the CME announced that in early November, they're going to launch a pork cutout contract. And if you take that efficiency in the marketplace and that competition for livestock from the packer to the producer, I think that cutout is going to be an excellent uh, example of something that the beef industry could really pick up on as we look at, at mechanisms to price cattle in the future that incorporates the individual carcass merit and isn't so dependent on traditional cash markets. Interesting, because we saw a big difference in the, the, the cash versus the, uh, the, the box beef cutout this yes, spring. Yes, we have. Yeah, incredible. What would you add, Greg? Well, I might add that, uh, you know, as we think about futures contracting and some of the positions people take on the board, I think that's a natural in the feedlot industry. It's not quite as much of a natural for a cow-calf producer. And part of that reason is because a feeder cattle contract is 50,000 pounds or, you know, 100, uh, 500 pound fe feeder calves. And so I think one of the things that we talked about in our report, the Packers and Stockyards report that we released in July, is maybe an opportunity to have many contracts. In the grain industry, there are many contracts. So a producer that doesn't have as big of a farm or want to commit as large of a percentage of his yearly production at one time has an opportunity to use a smaller contract. And I think that's something that uh, the industry might should discuss with uh, uh, the CME as, as a new product that might be good for cow-calf producers. Intriguing, particularly given the fact that the average size of the cow herd less than 50 head, right? So it makes That's sense. Correct. Tanner, what would you add from an NCBA perspective? You know, I mean, Don and I spend a lot of time speaking at length about all the all the issues in the futures market and maybe the potential tools coming there, but I want to talk a little bit about in the cash space. You know, uh, in Undersecretary Ibaugh's report, they outlined the need for some additional platforms to, to trade fed cattle. Uh, the fed cattle exchange is a great example of that, um, but there needs to be some tweaks made to that to incentivize participation by all of the major packers and some of the regionals as well in order to make that tool even more uh, of a price discovery tool. And then kind of to that end, you know, I think uh, the throughout the course of this working group conversation that's dealing with price discovery, we talk about the need to increase negotiated trade across the regions. Well, that takes two forms. It takes the form of either negotiated cash or negotiated grid so that producers can still have that negotiation that's contributing to price discovery but they also get to realize premiums for the high quality carcass traits that they're putting up on the rack because of the herd genetics improvements that they've made and all of the, the different steps along that cow's life cycle. So making sure that we have the ability to provide that to them in a way that provides negotiation and then perhaps even incorporating that into some sort of an online platform so that it gives producers real time access to real market information um, at any given time. Really intriguing what innovations might come from this. So Jim, I've got to ask you, right? I, I mean, at the end of the day, what I know about risk management is you pay a premium. You are paying some form of money for somebody else to take an opposite position on you. And, and basically, sometimes you win and sometimes they win. How risky is it to not have a risk management plan at all? So, good question. I mean, one of the risky components of this is, and it probably becomes more of a factor in the future, is talking to your lender. You know, being able to get financing, you know, having a sound risk management program will really help uh, solidify your business. But that risk management program doesn't need to be super complex and it might not even involve futures at times. It can be, you know, when you market your cattle, what time of year. Forward contracting is another form of a derivative, so that's a futures market per se. So, you know, if, if the price of corn looks like it's going to be high, you might want to market your cattle on the video earlier than you normally would. You know, simple things like that are really key in trying to diversify when you market cattle. So Don, he mentioned bankers. Uh, what are the things that producers should consider as they work with bankers to develop and execute um, risk management plans? You know, the, the number one thing I always say when asked that question, communication absolutely the most critical component. 
Then you go into more details of, of what's the risk profile of the customer and, and that has an influence on the amount of risk management that really needs to be in place. That's really helpful. Thank you guys. Now we'll be back to wrap up this special edition of Cattlemen and Cattlemen right after this. Don't go away. Are you concerned about the impact government policies could have on your cattle business? One way to make your voice heard in Washington is by joining NCBA. When you join, you'll have access to key policy updates and insights from Beltway Beef. It's the best way to hear directly from NCBA's DC team. Beltway Beef provides valuable policy information and it's free for NCBA members. Stay in touch with Beltway Beef. Join now at ncba.org. What does it mean to be dependable? It means you do what you say you'll do time and time again. Because performance isn't optional, and your task is essential. For over 95 years, we have proven ourselves to be the most dependable choice. That's why the cattlemen of this great nation trust Ritchie to provide fresh water on demand. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattlemen since 1921. In the world of cattle vaccines, when you see fewer reactions, you'll notice healthier cattle and higher profits too. Because sometimes good protection is about what you don't see. Protect your productivity with cattle vaccines from Merck Animal Health. Proven to cause fewer reactions. You'll like what you see. Our trusted portfolio is just one more way Merck Animal Health works for you. Talk to your veterinarian and visit CattleFriendlyVaccines.com to learn more. have an upcoming production sale to advertise? Then contact the Cattlemen to Cattlemen marketing team to learn more. Welcome back. Gentlemen, as we wrap up the show today, I'd like to ask each one of you what advice you might have to viewers at home in terms of this risk management challenge that we face in the industry. Tanner, do you want to begin? Sure. I think that uh, risk management can be as simple or as complex as you want to make it. It just needs to make sense for your operation. And sometimes it's it's very daunting uh, task to look at all of the options. You know, you have USDA programs, private programs, the CME group, all these different tools. Um, in addition to all of just the operational changes you can make on your ranch to, to manage risk. There are resources out there to help you make those decisions. That is a daunting task by itself at times. Um, you can reach out to your county extension agents, your land grant institutions, and then NCBA has resources for producers as well. Really do reach out and utilize those memberships. Really do reach out and utilize those tools because ultimately they're there to help you make better decisions. Great, great point. Jim, you spent a lot of time on this topic. What would you say? So I'd add three things to this. First, I mean, know your break even. So that's gonna be your lighthouse when, when times are stormy. And you're gonna have to make quick decisions sometimes. And if you know your break even, and that's part of your homework, you can make those decisions soundly without getting pulled emotionally one way or another too far, we hope. And then also know your basis. For that class of cattle you're dealing with, know what your normal cash price is during that time period relative to the futures for that time period and that'll help you set your expectations and to talk to your lender and know if you've met your break even or not and then finally you know do your homework once a week and be informed you know kind of know what the general cash market's doing uh, understand what might be happening happening uh, macroeconomically as well trade currencies you don't have to get too caught up into it but you have to sift through lots of noise, so do some homework and weekly. keep up to date is what you're saying. That's right? correct, yeah. yes. You have to be, you know, throughout the entire year. So we have over 50 weeks a year, we need to do our homework. Don, what would you add? You know, Kevin, I've been in the, uh, was in the brokerage business for better than 30 years. And, and my experience was somebody new to the market, 
uh, trying to find a broker to work with. They take the recommendation of their banker. They take the rec recommendation of a friend. And my, my principal advice is to shop around. And if you find that broker and the customer who's both personality profiles, risk personality profiles align, the chances of that being a successful relationship is much greater. Got to have a lot of trust there, yes, don't you? Yes, you do. Yeah. Mr. Undersecretary. Well, you know, I started out uh, talking about how, uh, you know, cattlemen are independent. And I don't think any cattleman ever, you know, wants to hear, hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> but uh, that said, USDA does have a lot of information available that an independent and cattleman can use to look up prices, understand what's going on in the marketplace, and use that to inform his decisions. It's historical as well, so if you need to go back and do the homework to understand what the, what the price trends have been the last few years, USDA can help you do that. You know, as we uh, look at uh, other opportunities at USDA to provide education and work with Extension, which starts here at USDA, and maybe even use some of our grant programs to uh, partner up with your, within your industry or your state cattlemen's association to put on a risk management seminar. I think that's a great opportunity. You know, we, I said that uh, nobody says we want to hear about help from the government. But the president and the secretary have done quite a bit over the last few years to prop up the agricultural industry with the trade mitigation payments and now the COVID uh, payment programs that are out through CFAP uh, one and now two. Uh, we are helping producers cope with the market uh, by volatility and be able to uh, put some money in their pockets until we can get back to normal. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much. And thank you all for sharing your perspective with us. I, I like to say that the last 12, 14 months have created a real learning moment for all of us in the beef industry and kind of shown a bright light on, on some of the areas that we individually need to focus our, our own efforts and energies on in trying to, to manage uh, those uncertainties, Tanner, that you mentioned before. And I don't think they're going to go away anytime soon. So uh, we appreciate your insights. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the resources that USDA offers to farmers and ranchers to help manage risk, visit the website rma.usda.gov. And Rabobank is the world's leading financial services provider for the food and agribusiness sector. If you're looking for good sound tools and information, check out their website. That's rabobank.com. And don't forget, Every day, the NCBA staff here in Washington, D.C. and in Denver is working to protect the interests of cattle producers all across the country. Join in the fight to protect our way of life by becoming an NCBA member. Just call 866-233-3872 or you can visit the website ncba.org. Well, that wraps up this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen from our nation's capital. Thanks again to all of our panel members for their wisdom and insights, and thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week, right here on RFD TV. Yeah.